Evelyn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> uh, welcome, Matilda. I'm so happy to have you here at the family today. I'm super happy to be here. Um, I think I did a pretty bad job at pitching front in my intro, so I want to rectify that. Can you tell us what front is? How yeah. would you define it? Um, I've struggled for the best uh, six years doing it, so I don't know if I'll do a good job. But uh, at front, we're reinventing email for the way teams work. So you can imagine that you take an inbox like Gmail and Outlook, and you add things like collaboration, <laughs> workflows, accountability, transparency, and the hope is that every person that uses email at work can eventually use front and be more efficient and more engaged. Okay, I think that was good. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so how did it all start, and how long ago? Um, so it started five and a half years ago in Paris, uh, where I met my co-founder, who is the CTO of the company. At that point, we had no idea we would come to uh, the US. I had never traveled outside Europe, so it was already a big deal for me to start a company. Um, I had no idea Front would be just as big as it is today. Um, so we started in Paris. Um, we launched a product, so the only thing I was doing in the early days was writing some content so that people could come to our website and sign up for the product, and then I could ask them, what are you looking for? And then the only thing that my co-founder was doing was building a product. And so that's all, zero distraction. And we did that for probably like, I don't know, four months. It was very depressing because we would get people interested, show them the product, they wouldn't be interested. So <laughs> then I would tell my co-founder, we're one feature away from uh, having our first customer. And so we would build a feature, then they would try, not use it. So I would tell him we're one feature away now. <laughs> and it just went through that cycle for the first four months until we had our first customer. And then we went through AC. So what was the, the first idea that you had? How did, how did you come across this idea? So the first idea has always been we want to reinvent email and we need to find a specific pain point as narrow as it is so that we can enter the market because it's a huge market and no company has ever managed to just build a company and make money out of an email product for businesses. So we chose shared email addresses as the way we would enter the market. So we built an email client and we said if you have a shared email address like contact at sales at, you can add it to front and it will be a better solution than a mailing list or help the solution. So that's what we launched. One thing I learned yeah. um, is that, so because we had such a big idea of changing um, how email works, and then we had such a tiny product, which was a shared inbox product, I often had a really hard time p telling people, I was almost ashamed to say, oh, it's a shared inbox product. Um, and I think you should never, never be ashamed of pitching the product the way it is, because if you always start pitching the big idea, then no one gets it. And so it won't help you get any customer, get any feedback on what you're doing. Um, so that's something I learned the hard way, but that mm -hmm. would be my advice. That's a good advice. And I wanted to ask you too, like, um, what was the most unexpected thing about building a company? And I mean by that, like something you thought would have been easy, that was actually really hard, or something you know you would have thought like, oh, that's a piece of cake, and then it ended up being like really, really hard. Um, so I think the unexpected thing is it's hard for everyone. So I'll tell you one story. So we went through Way Combinator. Every Tuesday night, we have a dinner. Someone is speaking about their company. And so we were listening to the founders of Stripe and Airbnb and Dropbox. They seem like super successful companies. When you look at their products, it seems super obvious that it's a good idea. And they were telling us, like, one, it's always been hard. We would you know, wake up one uh, out of three days wondering if it really makes sense to keep doing what we're doing. And I thought, OK, if these companies n face such hardship, then you should stop wondering if it's normal that it's hard because it's hard for everyone. And th that's one. Two, it just gets harder. So if you think that once you hire people, you raise money, like whatever, you have so many customers, so now if one customer churn, it's not a big deal or like whatever, wrong, 100% <laughs> wrong. Like the stakes are higher and so everything is harder. Yeah, that's a fallacy that most entrepreneurs think. Like, oh, when I raise my Series A, everything will be easier. Right. Never. Uh, because the truth is, a startup is, the definition is it needs to grow. And, you know, if you want to grow every year at pretty much the same rate, then what you need to do every year is all the previous years combined, which means that what has worked in the past won't work in the future. But if you screw up, you screw up big. So then every year it's harder. 
Yeah, it reminds me also of this uh, phrase, quote from Paul Graham that says uh, um, that the default state of a startup is death. And you're just trying to, it sounds awful, <laughs> like nobody's going to launch a company after this. But, um, but I find it you know, very, very encouraging on the opposite when you say just it's hard for everyone. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah, um, so something that I found while you know, I was researching for this interview is I looked at your company's Glassdoor. I don't know if everybody here knows Glassdoor is a website where you can rate uh, employers and, and companies. And I saw that your company, you have 100% approval rate, and I don't know how that's even possible. Um, and also, you have, your company has a 99% recommendation uh, rate on Glassdoor. So, you know, first, what's the secret? And second, um, I wanted to know about you know, your core values as a leader. Yes, so it's probably something I could talk about for five hours. <laughs> uh, and if you're expecting me to say, so this is how to do it, and then go do it, and you have that, that won't, work, that won't happen. Um, so I can tell you a few things. So one, I deeply care about it. And so the reason I started this company is because I wanted to create an environment where people would be happy to come to work every day, starting with me being happy to come to work every day. And so I think the moment you start caring so much about something, then usually you'll do everything it takes in order to succeed. Um, so there are a, f a lot of values that we have at France that uh, I think I have as a leader and led to this engagement. So the first one is transparency and you hear a ton about transparency but it's super easy to say you're a transparent company. It's super hard to actually be a transparent company because you know it's when things are hard the last thing you want to do is to tell your team because it's hard enough. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there are so many examples of things that we've done to always be transparent. So for example, you know, every Monday morning we have an all hands meeting, we go over all the metrics of the business and whether it's good or bad, they will see it. In the office we have dashboards with everything, all our calendars are public so there is a default trust. People can ask any question about anything at a Q&A that's anonymous and we will get back to them. So I think this transparency builds trust but also builds a lot of engagement because you know why you're doing what you're doing. So the first time I was asked to talk about this topic, which was how to create engagement at scale, I was like, I don't even know like why we have, uh, it's my first company. So I emailed our like a few employees, maybe 10, and I asked them, why are you so happy? And many reasons, but the number one reason was I can see the impact of my work and I care about our mission. And so I thought that was super important because then you can really summarize it in two things. One is you need to have a mission that's clearly stated and that people care about. So at front it's work happier. And then you need to make sure that everyone understands why the work they're doing will contribute to that mission. And if they do, then they'll be happy. And it's not about you know, how much they're paid, what benefits we have, etc. although like this help, but if you think that that's why people are happy, then they won't truly be happy. Yeah, okay, that <laughs> makes sense. Um, also you mentioned, so you mentioned transparency clearly is one of your um, core values. Um, but I was wondering, so you yourself, as a CEO, you write a lot and you write very openly about the different aspects of running a company. And yes. who, did someone encourage you to do that? Where does this desire to share come from? Uh, so, I, I mean, th the initial reason why I started writing was I wasn't writing about my journey uh, because no one cared. I had a company with two people and zero customer. Uh, but I started writing about the future of email because I, feel like I realized that people cared about writing about email and communication. So it was a tactic to get leads and that's it. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't doing it for anything else. Um, and then I enjoyed it. Um, so I actually don't know why I enjoy it. I think I enjoy it because one, it helps me clarify my thoughts and um, two, I just feel like most of the time people write things that are not interesting and so I wanted to write <laughs> interesting things. So, but then I, so I started sharing and I started sharing a lot about my journey. So now if you go on Medium, you can read pretty much everything and you can ask me anything, I'll tell you anything. And so there are a few reasons I kept doing it. One, um, all I care about is the impact I have. Like if I 
right to clarify my ideas, but no one is reading it, then I will stop doing it because it actually takes a lot of time. And so the fact that so many people read these articles and told me it was helpful is the number one reason why I'm writing. I'm not writing, like, now it doesn't bring any customer. It builds a brand for France, which is good, but there are more efficient ways to do this. Mm -hmm. So the number one reason is for the impact I have. And and then the other reason is just because I, whenever I was in a situation where I didn't know how, how to do something, like I wanted to raise a Series A and I was like, I will just, you know, look online at a deck and then I'll just do the same thing and then I couldn't find one. And so then I built one and uh, I published it. It's the uh, same for Series B. So like it's also solving a problem that I had that no one was solving. It's super interesting because it's like almost like we're following your journey as a founder and you keep saying like, it's, a, it's my first company and I'm only doing this for the first time. But you know, it's like you write so openly and you, you guys should really go check out her Medium page. I think I found like two hours last week <laughs> reading Great. your Medium articles and, and they're really, really good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so did you like it? Yeah. yeah okay, yeah. great. Uh, I'll keep writing them. Yeah, cool. Um, so it was also one of the things that you um, talk about is, and I find really interesting because we are in an industry, as you know, that um, celebrates visionaries and people who have, you know, great ambitions and great visions and all that's great. Um, but you are, you come out and say, well, I think discipline matters more than vision. And I find that really curious. Can you explain a little more about that? Yeah, so um, many things. Uh, so one, um, I think I'm someone that's very disciplined, but I didn't understand why it served us so well. So. Recently, I've been reflecting, and so I'll explain what discipline means and what I think, um, what impact it has. But it all started with, I don't know, a few years ago, I started very occasionally investing in companies. And so then startups would email me with their updates. And then, and it was a few years ago, and then I saw a pattern where if a company sends updates at the same frequency, it can be weekly, monthly, quarterly, it doesn't even matter, with the same format, then almost every time they, ha they, they all succeed and then the moment, sometimes they write, sometimes not, one day they talk about revenue and then the following week or month or a quarter they talk about users, then they don't succeed. And so uh, obviously it's not black and white, it's not 100% true, and 100 but like it was so obvious to me that I started thinking about this topic. And so, the reason I think that discipline matters so much is because I think there are so many uh, you know, preconceived ideas about how you are successful that are wrong. And so one of them being, you'll be successful if you have a great idea uh, and the market is ready. And like, of course you need to get a good idea. But first, the only thing you need to have is a product that's solving a pain point. It doesn't even matter how big your market is because the truth is you'll have all the opportunity you want to expand this market. And so, you know, we went from shared inbox to email to operating system. And I didn't start the company thinking that the vision I would pitch would be that big. So it doesn't matter. Um, so in that sense, vision doesn't matter as much. What matters is what you, what pain point you are initially solving. And once you know what pain point you're initially solving, then the only reason why you will grow is because you'll be insanely disciplined about doing so. And so, for and there are just so many ways you can be distracted. You can lie to yourself, which I feel like is the biggest thing that entrepreneurs do. It's so hard that you don't want to face the reality of our revenue is not growing, our biggest customer churned, but you have to because if you don't, then you'll fail. And I think having the discipline of, you know, always sticking to one metric, always looking at it, always communicating around it, and having absolutely no excuse and no distraction, but making this metric grow, especially when you're super early, I think is the reason why we've been uh, successful. Um, so now if you look at, you know, how I spend my weeks or how I spend my days or whatever, you'll probably think I'm a robot. Like, I know at the beginning of the week, I know exactly what I'm going to do during the week. At the end, my assistant will send me what percentage of time I spent on every topic. I tell her I want to spend 33% of my time on, on hiring and then maybe it depends every week. But, um, and I make sure that she follows that. Um, Every Thursday afternoon, I go back home. I don't have a computer. I don't have a. I just have a notebook. I don't have, even have my phone. And I step back and think about what are the biggest 
uh, opportunities I'm not seeing for front, what are the biggest risks I'm not thinking about. And it's, it requires so much discipline for me to do all these things because, you know, there is always something super important I need to do, like this super amazing candidate I should close, and that seems to be more important than, you know, going back to my backyard and writing on a notebook. But it's actually not. So I've become very convinced that discipline was a huge reason why we were successful, and it's always hard for me to say, you know, that's why everyone will be successful, but I know that that's why we've been successful so far. In your own case, yeah. Um, that's super, I mean, I find it super inspiring. I'm not really, I'm not a disciplined person at all, so I want to learn how to be like it. you. <laughs> I know, like, um, that actually reminds me of one of our top portfolio companies. The CEO, he sends us a report every Thursday. And I remember the story of one Thursday, it was Christmas Eve, and he was on a mountain skiing. So we didn't get the report, and we were like, huh, you know? And then the guy was like, I'm so sorry, there was no signal. Here's the report at like midnight. <laughs> so, you know, it's, um, it really goes to show that discipline can make a difference, and even in the, you know, in the small details. But I was wondering, so one of the things you mentioned is that you make yourself accountable. So you have your assistant, you tell her, okay, so I want to spend, I don't know, 30% of my time hiring, and then at the end of the week, she tells you like the breakdown of where you spend your time and how you failed or accomplished this. Is there any other ways you make yourself accountable or more disciplined? Yeah, so first of all, I don't, so I don't have any notification anywhere. Like I don't have any notification on my phone, on my apps. And so then I have a lot of time for focus work. And I think you can, you know, you need that because otherwise you can, you tell yourself, I'll do this and that and that, but then, okay, you have a notification, seems important, click on it, and then you've been distracted. So I think that helps a lot, and just in my personal life and professional life, I think it helps me be healthy. Um, two, is just like everything in my day is scheduled in advance, so even time to think, or like email time, and or time to think about uh, our culture, which seems very abstract, but if I don't spend the time, then I'll never spend the time, and so... I, like for me, this was working. It's just making sure that you know I have at the top of my head all the topics I want to constantly uh, think about and make sure that I have the time to do so. So that's one thing. That's my own discipline. But then I need to show that to the team because if I so strongly believe that that makes people successful, then I want to encourage them to do the same and I want to force them to do the same. So the communication I do to it is, for example, at the beginning of every week, at the same time, every Monday morning, all my direct reports will receive an email called top of mind, and then I tell them, this week, here is what's top of mind for me. For example, closing our head of sales, plus preparing for the board meeting, plus whatever. And always at the same time. The reason I do this, that is because if they know what's important to me, then usually that should be reflected in what they're working on, because that's how it works. So by sending this email, you know, every Monday morning at the same time, there is a company-wide email, our all hands on Monday morning is always the same format, and we just follow it so that we and make sure... And you wrote a Medium post on how to conduct an all hands meeting, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, uh, there are just so many small things that either are for me or for people that work directly for me or for people that are at the company. Um, and then they see the value, and so they do the same, so their team sees it, so then they do it. I want to spend a little bit more time talking about um, your Thursday habit. Sure. Um, I mean, yeah. Yeah, can you tell us what it is? I'm, I'm sorry for the mystery, guys. <laughs> I mean, so it's pretty simple. So on Thursday at 1 p.m., I go back home, and uh, that's it. So I go back home. And so then I, so the problem is I'm thinking about a million things. So first I need to stop thinking so I can go running, play the piano, have a shower, like whatever, um, probably like 30 minutes. And then I have an hour and a half where I just have a notebook. And it's super hard because I think in this world where you have constant notifications all the time, you forget to be by yourself with nothing else than just thinking about a specific topic, that is, what are you not thinking about, which is a pretty hard thing to think about. So, an hour and a half, and I force myself, and every time, after 25 minutes, I'm bored, and I'm like, I don't have anything else, but the truth is, it doesn't matter if I start thinking about whatever, um, anything, um, because I'm in the right state of mind, and so I will have one brilliant idea for like 30 seconds out of the entire 
1.5 hours sometimes, sometimes zero, but that's enough because I would have never had this uh, thought or idea otherwise and it's worth it. So I spent an hour and a half thinking about that and just with my um, notebook. And what happens at the end of this one and a half hour is I have a huge to-do list. So I started thinking about um, like so many things I'm not thinking about. And so then I have one and a half hours where I do my to-do list and or I add it to my you know, computer to-do list. Um, and then it's the end and I have dinner. It's exhausting. <laughs> uh, I can't work after that. Um, so it's like, yeah, from 1.30 to, I don't wow. know, 5, 6. I mean, you touch on a very good point, which is, you know, one of the challenges of our current generation in the workplace is to find uninterrupted time to do meaningful work, which is what you do with this um, company. Yeah, and after reading, to be honest, like after reading your articles, I actually stop all notifications. <laughs> yeah, I um, mean, I, so that's the reason why we build Front and we don't build Slack, for example. So uh, we also use Slack and sometimes it's great, but I think that all, there are so many communication tools that are synchronous and the expectation is, you know, for you to read it and get back to the person, that's how it's been designed, so you can't even be upset about people having this expectation. And one thing that's wonderful with email is it's asynchronous, so you can you know, snooze it, put it in a folder, deal with it later. And I think that people actually like it. Now, there are many things they don't like about email, which is what we're trying to fix. Uh, but I do think that asynchronous is much better for efficiency and mental health. Yeah, I agree. And so what are the, what are the technologies and habits you think that you know, promote that kind of mailing for, I mean, besides front and cutting notifications, is there anything else? Um, so, I, one, I try to lead by example. I was on PTO for two weeks, uh, three weeks ago, I think. Taking some time off is insanely important. Um, then the, there are many things that we do at front where, you know, we tell people as soon as they arrive at the company that they should first take care about them take care of themselves and then think about work and not the other way around. So, and then, you know, we give a credit every month so that they can exercise because I think it's important. We do lunch and learns and we talk about how food impacts the way you feel. So, it, yeah, it's a lot of small things, mm -hmm. but it's most importantly at the core of the product we build. So, yeah, it's it reminds me of this book, um by the guys, I forget the name of the company, it's called uh, Doesn't Have to be Crazy at Work. You know this? No. Well, anyway, the, it's a book that they, they talk about how um, most startup offices today are designed to have people spend as much time as possible in the office, where they you know, build like games and, and yeah. cafeterias, and what you said sounds like you, you want people you know, to... Yeah, so it's actually something super trendy. Uh, I don't know if you know Alexis Sohanian, the yeah. founder of Reddit. Uh, now, all he does is, so one day he started tweeting about the fact that people st should stop thinking that hustling is so great. And uh, now all he talks about whenever he's invited is about making sure that people have a personal life because, mm -hmm. and they spend the time because that's how they'll be so good at their job. Um, the, another person that I'm a huge fan of is Justin Kahn, who was the, cre the creator of Justin TV. Um, and he was a YC partner when I was in YC, he was actually my partner. And, um, and then, I don't know, I think he burned out, and so then realized that he completely had to change everything he was doing, starting meditation every day, changing how he eats, and has been writing a ton about it. So if you want to follow him on Twitter, like every, every day, he tweets multiple times a day about um, how he's building Atrium, which is a successful company that went from you know, zero to 200 employees in two years, and uh, so great, but at the same time, we'll spend enough time to take care of himself, and I find him very inspiring. It's, it is. Um, I, that also reminds me of, uh, you wrote a post on, you know, how life is greater than the company you're running, uh, which was about, a, you know, a topic that's uh, not easy to talk about when your co-founder got sick, and also, on a more personal note, happier note, uh, it's an emotional roller coaster. But you were off. You said like you were uh, on vacation recently because you were on your honeymoon. Congratulations! Yes. Thank you. On being married, um, can you yeah talk about that and 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 how you manage you know to to have this uh, work life balance? 
Yeah, so I think it's, I mean, I still today, I, it's, I struggle so, so much with it because, I mean, just yesterday night, I went to sleep at 5.30 and then woke up at 8. So, like, you know, I can be the person saying, yeah, you should sleep and exercise and then look at what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So, one, I think it's, even if I say it and I try super hard, like, the truth is, it's every day I need to fight because when you're starting a company and or you're at a startup and you care about it, then all uh, everything that's in your head is your company and you're constantly thinking about it. And so it, it matters, so it's normal, plus it's a moment in your life where you should probably do this because you've decided to do it. So for me, um, that's how I um, was living until, I don't know, 2017. And then my co-founder got sick, and then uh, he had a cancer. It was super advanced. Uh, we didn't know much about whether uh, he would make it, and now he is cancer-free, so it's a great story. Yeah. Um, but it's the first time I realized that it was just a job, and I think there, like, we shouldn't expect something like this, which is super terrible for us to understand that it's just a job. Like, the truth is you have a life, and you know your family and your health and your friends, all of that is more important than your job, and it's the truth. And you need to make the time for it, and the only way I have managed to do it is to be super disciplined about it again. So every morning, I wake up, have a shower, and then meditate for 10 minutes. Um, and then every weekend, at least one day, uh, I don't work at all, I don't have any, I actually delete my apps so that because if, it's, if, if I don't delete it, like, I check my emails and Slack and then it's dead. So like, you delete the apps and then you reinstall them yeah. after. Wow. Pretty <laughs> painful. Um, now we're growing and so we have a SSO, so it's a nightmare. But I still do it because I think it's very important for the success of this company. I think it's super brave that, you know, like, I guess most employees of a company would agree, like, of course, I want, you know, work-life balance, but for a CEO to come out and say, you know what, this is a job, I yeah. think it's, it's very rare. Yeah, and I mean, so there are many, so for example, a few months ago, we had an employee that um, I really like, um, and she told me, so she was in San Francisco, and she told me, um, I actually don't feel great in this city, um, and so I'm not happy, um, and so I'm gonna leave, and I'm going to travel. And it's always hard um, to hear that when it's an employee that you think is great. But then I really took that as an opportunity during our all hands to tell the team, uh, one, this person is living, and two, like, I really admire the choice she's made. I think it's very courageous. I think it's easy when you like a job and she really loved her job to just you know, keep doing it. But then you have to step back sometime and make really tough decision. Like she doesn't know if she'll find a job that you know will make her happier. And she told me that. But at the same time, she knows that she can find you know a way of life that makes her happier. And I would encourage her to do that. Mm. You you spoke earlier about um, your YC experience and talking to Justin Ken. Um, I wanted to tell us about. Um, so you were working, you know, doing the inbox, uh, reinventing the inbox, and you got to meet the guy who actually invented Gmail at yes. Google, and he gave you some advice. Yeah. So that was so one of the founders of YC is Paul Bohite, PB, and he was the guy who created Gmail 15 years ago. And so when I, I went into YC and we, when we were accepted, I was telling everyone, my friends and my family, I'm so happy because I'm building this email company and I'm going to meet the founder of Gmail and I'm, I'll be able to ask you know, all these questions I've been struggling with. So from a strategy standpoint, should we do this? Should we do that? Should we do that? And so here come the times, you know, maybe three weeks after we joined YC where we have a meeting with him. And, and I tell him, so this is what we're doing, and then now I have this existential question, should I do A, B, C? And he told me, just follow your growth. And I was like, great, thank you so much. Like, I really didn't need the founder of Gmail to tell me that. But I understood afterwards that, you know, that's actually the best advice um, he can give me, because, and I think YC's, uh, 
I don't know, is Wacy's slogan, I don't know how you say it, is uh, make something people want. And it seems obvious, like make something people want, okay, thank you. Um, but it's actually the only thing that matters. And so the, the reason why uh, Paul told me that is because, yes, he has some knowledge about Gmail, but when he created it 15 years ago, the reality of how people work today is different than 15 years ago. Two, um, he actually doesn't know anything about our business. Um, so I know our market, I know our customers better than him. And as much as I respect him, you know, he can't tell me it would be a big mistake. And in my journey, so many people have, like, I think you have a tendency to be willing to give advice, but you need to really take them with a grain of salt because they don't know anything. You're the only one to know. And so follow your growth is just like the most pragmatic thing someone can tell you, yet the, the most relevant thing someone can tell you. Um, so I thought that was useful, and, and then after this moment, I stopped thinking that you know we'll be successful when I get to talk to X Y Z, and or when Sequoia invests in my company, and Brian Schreier is joining our board, and Brian Schreier was the first board member of Dropbox and Qualtrics, which are two companies that are widely successful horizontal products, SaaS businesses, so many things that are relevant to us, and so I was like, yeah, Brian Schreier will give me so many you know advice on how to succeed. Zero, <laughs> and, but but he also set this expectation, and I think you should you know you should never think oh, I'm meeting this person that's amazing. This person will solve my problems. Your advisors will be happy to. <laughs> no, they can do a ton for you though. Um, so for example, you know, one of the things that Brian Shares does for me is uh, I, one of my biggest focus right now is to hire more experienced people. I've never worked with more experienced people uh, before. And also, he is very convincing when he says that Front is the most promising company he has invested in, given he has invested in Dropbox and Qualtrics. So if he can help me hire these executives, then it's, in, like, it's super useful. But that's very different from telling me, okay, so these are the targets you should hit, and this is the segments you should target, and this is the messaging you should use. But that he can't tell me. Yeah. And how big is Front as a company today, just to give us an idea? I think 115 employees. 115 yeah. employees? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you are, I guess, all over the world with clients all over the world. Yes, we have 5,000 paying customers, 40% in Europe, 60% outside Europe. That's cool. Yeah. Do you have an office here in France? Yes, there are some people from our office that are here today. Where are they? I wanted to say hi. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's why I'm here, actually. It's because I wanted to come and... So we have a new office. Nice. Um, Where is it? It is uh, Strasbourg Saint-Denis, 347 <laughs> rue Saint-Martin. Um, <laughs> you can come and visit us. Uh, and yeah, so I wanted to spend time with them, get to know the people I've never met, and tomorrow I'll do all hands and share a few things that I hope will be useful. Um. Cool, so you're obviously French. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask, um, what's it like being a Frenchie in the Valley? Like, what's your experience? What's the reputation? Anything? So the only funny thing, so I don't have anything meaningful to say about it. So my experience is it's exactly the same as it's like, what is it like being a woman tech for me? And what is it like being French? Like the truth is, um, what I've found is being a CEO of a company is insanely hard and then whether you're French or not we can make it you know, slightly easier sometimes and sli slightly harder but in the grand scheme of things it's like being a CEO of a startup is super hard mm -hmm. and that's the core of your job. Uh, the only funny thing that people tell me after they know me and they're comfortable telling me this is French people do have the reputation of being uh, like grumpy and so then when people meet with me for the first time they're always like oh, i'm so surprised it doesn't seem like a french person smiling all because you're nice yeah because i'm <laughs> nice um so i think that there is this cliche that i find interesting i don't know why people think that french i know people right are very nice yeah. yeah um cool i was also let me check just my notes um What's the most exciting thing about the future of France right now? So I think for me, there are two things that are exciting, and that's how I describe the opportunity of Front to whoever is considering helping joining. Um, 
So the potential for front is huge. Uh, there are like a billion email users. Uh, if you are installed on everyone's computer and you're part of their workflow, then if you deeply care about changing how people work, you can go beyond email. And we're in a great position to do that. Um, that's where we want to go. And then we, there is where we're at today. And I think where we're at today is we have healthy foundations in a sense that we're financially healthy, uh, we are growing, the people are amazing, they're both talented and they're low ego and they know what they don't know. Uh, we have enough customers that we can learn so much. And so there is this situation, which is we have great foundations and a very healthy company and this ambition. And what I'm excited about is I'm very competitive and so the, like knowing that we can get there drive me. And two is I deeply care about people and knowing that we can get there by working with these people and knowing that, you know, just tomorrow that there could be one person joining that could, because we're so early, change something meaningful that would really impact our trajectory from here to here is what drives me. That's a beautiful vision. I mean, who wouldn't want to work for a company like that? Um, I want to open uh, questions to the floor. So uh, you, you mentioned that uh, something really interesting is like the first four months, it was difficult for you to find a client and then you found your client and he started to be paying. And so what happened after? Uh, so I had to find two. Uh, and it's true, and then three, and it was insanely hard to get the second one and the third one. So the, the funny thing is, so when we were early, we, you could request access to our product, you could not, you could not sign up for it. And because I was writing a lot and the, I don't know, it had some traction, we actually had thousands of companies that signed up for the product. And so I would onboard them manually. Um, so first do things that don't scale and like my job was actually pretty painful. It was just like onboarding new people and then realizing that it was not sticky. Um, but I just kept doing it. And I think out of the 3000 companies that signed up, you know, maybe 10 ultimately became customers. So you need to be very, very patient. And it's not when, because you have one that you have two. It's not because you have two that you have three, et cetera. Yeah, and then just to follow up question, the, the second question is like, uh, when you talk with the, with, the, with the employee hiring someone, so in which phase you say, okay, well, I think I need to grow, I need to hire someone. Yeah, and, uh, it's a really good question. I think one mistake I did uh, was thinking that I should hire when I can't solve a problem. So, for example, in the early days, um, we were building this shared inbox. No one knows what shared inbox means. And so marketing was something I struggled with. Like content was the only thing that was working, but that's it. And it's really hard to target your buyer with content. So I thought, okay, I'm going to hire a marketing person and their goal will be to create demand. And I hired a person and didn't work out, we parted ways, hired a second one, didn't work out, parted ways. Um, and on the other side, all I was doing was these onboarding calls. And so we had people signing up and I was you know, doing a demo of the product and checking if they were using the product and then they would sign up. And so then I realized, and I, because it was working, I didn't hire for the, so I was, I think I brought our first 500 paying customers. Um, and so then I hired someone, an, an AE, uh, four years ago to do that. Um, and the thing I, the mistake I made was you should hire once you have something working versus hire to have someone figure out something that you don't know. Because the truth is, like, if as a founder, I, and I'm thinking and dreaming about front, I can't understand how I'll create demand because I don't know how to talk about front because I don't know which... Uh, segment we should target, then it's going to be insanely hard for someone to figure it out. Okay. Yeah, you can throw. Uh, so first, thank you for your talk. Thank um, you. I really, truly admire the way you're pushing away notification and distractions, but that that is you. So how do people in company um, embody that? Um, uh, way of uh, like working. Yeah. Work, yeah, it's it's a good question. So first, I don't force anyone to do it. Like that would be stupid. What works for me doesn't really uh, work for everyone. 
Um, so there are things where I can, you know, force people to do some stuff and things where I can't. So notifications, like people can choose whether they have notifications. The only thing I can do is within our own product front, we can build smart notifications so that the default is not you're notified for every single thing. But then there are still company policies that we uh, implement. So for example, I qu quite hate Slack because it's super distracting. Um, and so like, it's very rare that someone will post something in like random general, etc. And when I think it's not relevant, I will just delete it and then tell the person I've deleted it, send an email. And so I, th I can do that. That's okay because uh, I just like, I deeply believe that for everyone, an extensive usage of Slack is distracting. Now, you know, I don't believe that for everyone, zero notification is the way to go. So there is some balance to find. I want to see if there are some questions in the back. You can maybe, I would love to see, throw that, yeah. <laughs> Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, do you target uh, blue, blue chip companies in France? Because we, we in blue chip companies, we don't uh, heard a lot about uh, France, and I think it's a huge market for you. No, I know. So we do, and uh, so we, uh, there is an awareness. Uh, so everyone is looking at me because we need, so we need to work on awareness for France, because the main feedback we get when people try the product, or we just hear about it, they're like, how, like, how come I didn't know that it existed? It's actually a super hard problem to solve. So, um, you know, there is this category of softwares that say they define a new category. So, for example, Dropbox, you couldn't really describe it. Slack, same thing. Uh, Qualtrics, same thing. Like, so many companies. Intercom, super hard to describe. Um, and it's always a huge opportunity because it means that you're not just doing something that someone has done. So, like, I can't say it's just Salesforce, but better. Um, it's a shared inbox, which doesn't mean anything. Uh, so it's a huge opportunity, but it's also a huge challenge because then when you talk about it, it's very hard to know what will resonate with you. And what will resonate with you is not what will resonate with you, etc. So we have an awareness problem that um, I will work on, um, but it's also one of the hardest problems to solve at front. No, my question is, it, thank you for the answer, but I have another question is, why Front is more used by other startups than a uh, blue chip company? Why is that? Why is that, yeah. I mean, it's just because that's the world I'm in, and so people will hear about it. That's the reason why. So you don't target, you do not target, uh, I don't know, uh, with construction? Uh, we do, like, s s we have a lot of these companies being customers, so we do, but it's easier when you're a startup founder and you get to talk like I'm talking today to create awareness in this environment. It's easier, and so usually what, s so to answer your question, at the end of last year, we started understanding our customers better, understanding what verticals we had most traction in, and so it's things like, corporate travel companies, logistics companies, etc., and then being very deliberate into targeting these. And before then, it didn't really make sense. I on purpose chose a very generic message so that I could understand who would use it. Because I didn't create front thinking logistics companies or travel companies will adopt the product. So it was deliberate to not target anyone. Then what happened is I still had to talk about it. And what was easiest was this kind of thing, which led to startups using it. And then our, you know, we had 100 companies in our batch at YC, and so they were using it. Now, starting you know, six months ago, we started being more deliberate. And so then outbound makes sense. And knowing what buyer in what company and emailing this person and or attending conferences where these people are is now the way we target these companies. Does that make sense? Thank you. Of course. Don't, don't be scared to throw it. It's, uh, it won't hurt anyone. Thanks. Uh, so thanks a lot for your talk, Mathilde. I was wondering, um, did you have your first customer before going to Y Combinator? And uh, the other question is, like, could you tell me more in detail like how you found your first um, client? 
Yes, so we had our first customer using our product but not paying for the product because we had not implemented Stripe yet. So the state of the business at before YC was zero revenue, but maybe, I don't know, 20 companies using the product. Um, so that's to answer a question. And how did I find the person? I mean, I wrote content and then they signed up. It was a company building a lamp. And then I really wanted to test whether they would um, be willing to pay for it, but we didn't have Stripe, so I couldn't tell them, you know, write a check and send it to me. Um, so what I did was, um, I told them, can you send me a lamp, because I thought they were super cool, and uh, otherwise you can't use the product anymore. And then they sent me the lamp. And then I, so then I realized that they were willing to give me something, uh, and, <laughs> and it wasn't nothing, and then uh, they paid. Okay, great, thanks. Nice, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk again um, about discipline and how tough it can be not to be distracted throughout the week. Uh, I was curious to know how you know what you need to be working on next week. Uh, how do you know what's important and what, what is not? Yeah, tough question, good question. So, um, so I don't know, the truth is, as a leader, I need to make sure that we have some metrics that we're following and it can't, so Paul Graham writes a lot about it, when you're early, it needs to be one, and then it evolves and it will be maybe three. And so, you know, we'll watch closely our revenue growth, but we'll also watch closely our user growth and we'll also watch closely our churn, because if one of them doesn't go well, then you can really be screwed. Um, so because I know that ultimately that's what needs to go well because everything else, like hiring the best people, raising money and all these things will come from the company having momentum. Mm -hmm. And so I know that. It's super clear to me what I need to achieve. And then the question is, how can I personally impact this? And the answer is usually not, you know, uh, closing this deal, like sometimes, but um, in this specific situation, I spent Q1 f trying to find a head of sales, and I, in, like, I spent, I don't know, 40% of my time, which is huge, just interviewing potential head of sales. And I knew that because I started to see that in order to scale what was working, we had to have someone, otherwise our growth would slow down. And so that became like urgency number one. So I guess that's how I know, but you know, it's okay, then so now I have this set of cells and now I need to find something else to do. Okay, cool, thanks. Hey Mathilde, huge fan. Um, I would like to have your opinion on an article that actually Erica wrote. Um, like, why did we lose you to the States and what should change in Paris in order not to lose a future use? and future fronts. Yeah, so first I would, you know, I would really, um, I wonder if it's a good thing or a bad thing that you lost me to the States because the truth is, we, like, it's, it's, it really depends on the company you're building. I was building an email company and I was asking companies to trust a company with two people to deal with all their emails and it's super hard. And the truth is, um, in France, it was harder to convince companies than it was in the US. And the reason for that was in the US, most of the big companies that exist used to be small companies just a few years ago. So they have much more empathy than like a bigger company that has been a big company for 100 years in France. And so I decided to go there not because I was flying away from anything, but because I felt like if I wanted to build the most successful company in the fastest possible way, then that was my best bet. And it's not true for every company. I think you can build like a truly successful company like that can be bigger than anything created in France, but it wasn't the case for us. Now, because France, like it was a bet that worked, I've been able at the beginning of 2018 to open an office in Paris. And now I want this office to grow and to be our HQ for Europe and to have every function represented. And so, you know, sales success, marketing, um, product engineering. And so I believe that the potential of this company, so the part of this company in Paris, can actually be much bigger than if I had stayed here because I would have had an insanely hard time selling the product, raising money, etc. 
Das so, so the circumstances as in access to capital uh, and talent, that, that should get better then, uh, for you not to have to make the detour. Right, so I think it's a virtuous cycle. Like I, what I've witnessed in the past five years is everything has gone better, meaning it's easier than, it's much easier than it was five years ago to just start a company. It's more trendy to join a startup, so the talent pool is bigger. There is therefore more access to capital, all of that is great, and so then if that works, and so then the companies that are small become big, and so then they will you know, either buy, fund, or just use the products of the smaller companies because they'll have empathy, then you've created this virtuous cycle. So I don't, think not, I don't think anything could have been done five years ago because it takes time for this to happen, and I hope, and that's what I'm doing, I'll be able to give back to just make sure that it happens, and that will be my contribution. And I felt like this, because I care about this country, um, but I felt like this contribution was more impactful than me working on how will we fund more companies in France, where you know I had zero work experience, I couldn't do much. Okay, cool. In the back, can you throw it? Can you throw it in the back? <laughs> So thank you very much for uh, sharing your story with us. Um, you spoke about um, some uh, core values uh, that uh, uh, you see every day at your company, such as transparency or uh, the balance between professional and uh, private life. Do you have other um, core values that you have uh, every day at your job? Yes, so we have five. One is transparency, two is low ego, high standards, care and collaboration and so anytime someone joins the company the first thing they are pretty much the first thing they will hear about is what do they mean what they don't mean i find it super important to uh, explain what it means so for example I, I can give you two examples transparency is not about sharing everything about anything like i'm not sharing everything about anything and one day i had to let go someone that had been an employee for a while that i truly loved and everyone loved, and it was a super tough decision. All hands, Monday morning, I'm telling people, we parted ways with this person, and I wish him the best. Move on. And then uh, people started telling me, you're not living our values, you're not being transparent, we know nothing, and I had to explain that, you know, transparency is important, but privacy is even more important. So, like, I will put the privacy of this person, I didn't share because it was private information. So I think making sure that people understand that what transparency means, and it doesn't mean, you know, there is good transparency and bad transparency, and explaining what good transparency and bad transparency is, I can explain to you if that's interesting, um, is important. Another example is care used to be kindness, so your uh, values need to evolve over time as you see fit or you don't see fit. So the problem with kindness was people were too kind and so for example they had a hard time giving tough feedback because you know it's not I'm not kind if I'm telling you that you're really screwed up on this yet super important so it's actually I if I'm delivering tough feedback is because I truly care about you and I know that you'll be more successful if you know and you get better so um, yeah these are two examples of there's a whole book about the radical candor thing yeah so we have a radical Kind of training for any new employee that joined the company. Makes sense. Thank you. And last question. There's a gentleman in the back. Can you? Wow. Oh, sorry. Okay, <laughs> you go. Okay. Hi, I'm Flo Florian. Uh, one question is, uh, I understand very well what uh, Front does, but what I don't understand is, it's in a universe where everything is struggling against the email. Uh, everybody tries to write less and less emails. Everybody tries to switch as much as possible on uh, chat. And even in huge companies, they use Skype, Outlook. They are, uh, let's say, uh, uh, in a huge universe of many applications, many tools. And I don't understand very well how it is used on a daily basis and yeah. how your users use your product. Sure. So I'll explain to you a few things. One, uh, one thing that's very true is, you know, if what you are doing is obvious, then it's not a good idea because it would have done, it would have been done multiple times before. So it's very natural that not everyone will, when you pitch your idea, will think, oh, obviously. Um, so I think, of course, there is this trend. Email is dead. So the way I think about it is two ways. One, I think that there, the future of email at work and the future of email in your personal life is very different. 
If you just look at the numbers, the, the emails in your personal life keeps decreasing year after year to WhatsApp, Facebook, Messenger, and Instagram and stuff. Um, and if you look at work emails, they keep increasing year after year. So, you know, one of our first investors was the CEO of Slack, who is the first one to say email is dead, but if you really believe that, then I don't know why you would care about investing in an email company. So I think it's a very good uh, marketing uh, phrase to say that email is dead, but when you come back to the reality of how people work, then the truth is email is really how work gets done. And maybe, you know, in this circle, in SF specifically, we have people maybe using text messages in Slack and a little bit more, but 99% of the very traditional companies, I can, you know, bet tens of millions of dollars that 50 years from now, what they will use is email. And the last thing I would add is, my belief is the protocol is actually great, but the interface is broken, and that's what we need to fix, and it's because it's not been designed for teams, it's not real time, it's not lightweight, it's not integrated with the tool that you use, etc. That's the reason why people can have the tendency to move away from email, but the truth is, the protocol, is, like if you had to think about, okay, I'm going to invent something so that people can communicate with one another even if they don't have the same tool, then you will come up with the protocol of email. Thank you. Great. I mean, we'll stop it there so we can have some time after, you know, to chat with each other. Mathilde, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I was already me. a fan. Uh, thank and you. And now even more. Thank you.